So we have two more sections of material to cover. Okay, we're going to cover the lower leg, and then we're going to cover the foot and the ankle. Now, what you're going to see is just like we saw on the hand and the wrist, information is going to bleed over. Okay, it's going to bleed over big time because it's going to be very hard to differentiate what's happening at the lower leg and what's happening at the ankle. And don't worry, I'll turn on the thingies here real fast. Because, as you guys probably saw from your reading and saw from your homeworks, there's going to be a lot of carryover, right? This should be kicking on here in a second. There we go. So first things first, a lot of similarities between the forearm and the lower leg. We're going to be dealing with two bones, obviously our tibia and our fibula. The nice thing about the lower leg, a lot less muscles. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. If we think about it, I need a ton of dexterity. I need a ton of different motions. I need a ton of motor control using my hands, right? I do not need that much control at my foot and my ankle. And what we're going to see is that everything that attaches to my lower leg is going to have some sort of action at my foot and my ankle. Now, what's going to make this information a little more on the difficult side are a couple things. One is, like I said earlier, we're going to add in weight bearing. Okay, we didn't have to worry about that too much for the upper extremity. The other thing, this is what makes this section of material kind of unique. Start thinking about every structure that we talk about, whether it is nerve, artery, vein, muscle, tendon. It's all going to make a huge dramatic turn to get down to the foot. Okay, think about that. So that's something that we did not necessarily see in the upper extremity, but everything's going to make this huge dramatic turn to get down to the foot. And it's going to turn in multiple axes. It's going to turn in multiple planes. So what we're going to see is we're going to see that a lot of the muscles that attach into this section are going to have multiple actions, right? So if you think about it, we're going to go over a muscle called the tibialis anterior, or anterior tib for short. It not only is going to dorsiflex, but it's also going to invert. It's also going to support the medial longitudinal arch, which we'll get into later. So it's going to have multiple functions. It's going to have multiple actions, because that's what makes this material a little more on the difficult side. All right, so getting into osteology, like I said, we got two basic bones here. We got our tibia, we got our fibula. Okay, so let's draw in a little tibia. And then we're going to draw in a little fibula as well. Okay, so F is for fibula, T is for tibia. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a couple key functions here. Number one big function is that my tibia is going to do the vast majority of weight bearing. Okay, so tibia in all typical relative functional purposes is going to be the weight bearing bone. The fibula bears a tiny bit of weight. But to be perfectly honest with you, it is pretty insignificant. Depending on the textbook you read, it's anywhere from 0 0.01 up to 5%. I will tell you clinically, I've had patients, I've had patients recently walk into my clinic with a fibula fracture. No assistive device, no crutches, no nothing. Because that's how little their fibula bears weight. Okay, now I've had plenty of folks walk in with fibula fractures and they're not actually walking in because their fibulas bear quite a bit of weight. So I hate to give you the answer, it depends, but guess what? It depends. At the distal end, well, one thing I wanna cover here first. Remember, I'm gonna have two different tibio-fibular joints. 
I'm going to have a proximal tibial fibular joint. And I'm also going to have a distal tibial fibular joint. That's extremely important to remember because as we start getting into radiology next year, which is going to become a bigger and bigger issue, not only in this course, but also in your MSK series, we need to know which tibial fibular joint we're talking about because both of them are going to have very different clinical signs and symptoms, right? First one's the obvious. Does it hurt closer to your knee or does it hurt closer to your ankle? Well, duh right but we're also going to get into a lot of the structures that curve around and are in very close proximity to the fibular head at the proximal side so a proximal tibiofibular joint injury is going to have very different signs and symptoms very different complications very different let's call it medical emergencies that we need to watch out for so for testing purposes, remember finals about a month away, I would highly recommend highlighting whether or not it is a proximal or the distal tibiofibular joint because it trips up students every year. No pun intended. Yeah, okay, pun intended. So my proximal tibiofibular joint and my distal tibiofibular joint are going to be held together by a series of ligaments. These ligaments literally are going to be named based on what they are. Okay, so it says what it is is what it says here yet again, right? We're, you know, 26 weeks into anatomy and we're still going over the same concept. My proximal tibiofibular joint is going to be held together by two different ligaments. It's going to be held together by the anterior proximal, or depending on what textbook you're reading, proximal anterior, tibio fibular ligament. And there's also going to be a posterior proximal tibio fibular ligament. Now, at this point in your anatomy careers, those should be pretty easy pitches, right? It's holding together the proximal end of the tibia and the fibula. It's in the anterior compartment. How about we go ahead and call it anterior tibiofibular ligament? And hey, by the way, it's holding together the proximal joint. So let's go ahead and throw proximal on that too, just for good measure, right? So it should be a pretty easy easy structure to identify. The distal tibiofibular ligament, or I'm sorry, distal tibiofibular joint is going to be held together by three different ligaments. Okay, now this one is super important because we're going to get into a concept here after we discuss these called a high ankle sprain. Okay, high ankle sprain is very common in athletic injuries. It's very common, especially in high impact, high weight bearing, AKA I decided to hit the ground really, really hard injuries. So my distal tibiofibular joint is going to be held together by the anterior distal tibiofibular ligament. It's also going to be held together by the posterior distal tibio fibular ligament. The other one, the odd one, is going to be named based on more of the ankle joint and based more on where it sits. So the third one is going to be right in the middle. 
So the anterior distal tibiofibular ligament is going to be on the anterior side. Cool. The posterior one is going to be on the posterior side. And then we're going to have one that sits right in the middle. It is going to be called the cruel interosseous. And remember what interosseous means. Interosseous means between bones. Ligament. So I'm going to have two main ligaments up at the top in the proximal tibiofibular joint. I'm going to have three main ligaments in the distal section. Now, like I said, this becomes very, very important and is going to become even more important next year because what I'm going to do in diagnostic imaging is I'm going to throw on an X-ray. And that X-ray is going to be of the distal tibiofibular joint. So let me ask you guys this. If the anterior distal tibiofibular ligament, posterior distal tibiofibular ligament, and the cruel interosseous ligament was injured or ruptured, what would the x-ray look like? Because what does an x-ray show you? X-ray shows you bone, right? Okay. So is the x-ray going to show me the torn ligament? No, not this. There you go. If you guys didn't hear that, the space between the tibia and the fibula will be abnormal. Because if I have a ligament in the transverse plane holding two bones together, okay, and let's say here's over here is my fibula and over here is my tibia, and it separates, then I'm going to expect to see those bones to be separated as well. And that's actually what you see is you see an abnormal distance between the tibia and the fibula on x-ray. So you don't actually see the ligament. But what you see is you see the alignment of the bones. Okay, that's one of the big things. And we're going to go into this next year. We're going to talk about the ABCs of x-rays. And the A stands for alignment. Not only with fracture, but alignment relative to other bones as well. So when you guys hear high ankle sprain, that's what they are referring to, is they're referring to those three syndesmotic or syndesmosis ligaments, right? That's a term we've talked about in the past. What's a syndesmosis? What, say it loud. Right, so it's connected to bones, and the bones don't have a ton of movement between them, right? That's a, that's a syndesmotic joint, right? There's a little bit of motion, but it's not like our diarthrodial joints, right? So you'll see this a lot. A high ankle sprain, in layman's terms, is going to be an injury of the syndesmotic ligaments, okay? In other words, anterior distal tibiofibular, posterior distal tibiofibular, and potentially cruel interosseous ligament. Is it always all three ligaments affected? Never. It's rarely all three. More than likely, you're going to see two out of three. And But you're also going to be able to see that on x-ray, too, because you can actually see the fibula rotated a little bit. If you think about it, the anterior one is gone. The posterior one's intact, but we rotated out a little bit. Yep. Good question, though. The other big structure that we're going to see here is we're going to see a very large, and technically this is called a ligament. Depending on the textbook you read, some call it a membrane, some call it a ligament. It's technically a ligament because it attaches bone to bone. That's what ligaments do. And what we're going to see is we're going to see this large, and you guys will be able to see this if you cut down deep enough in cadaver lab, this large interosseous membrane or interosseous ligament. Now the interosseous membrane or ligament is going to be really important because it's going to serve a couple super, bless you, super key functions. First big key function is 
it's going to help support and hold that tibia and the fibula together, right? Because I don't need those guys floating out in the breeze. That would kind of mess up my lower leg, wouldn't it? Especially if I'm constantly crashing down on it, which is then causing my tibia and the fibula to expand. And we're going to get into that a little later. The other key function that my interosseous membrane is going to do besides providing an anatomical landmark is it's going to keep all the posterior stuff posterior and it's going to keep all the anterior stuff anterior and that's going to be really really important because just like we saw in the forearm what we are going to be able to do is use our cross-sectional anatomy skills and we're going to be able to segment out depending on where these muscles are located not only common actions, not only some common attachments, but also common innervation. And we're going to see that in a little bit. Now, at the very proximal section of the interosseous membrane, there's going to be a little hole. And that little hole is going to be called the aperture. Whoa, what happened? This computer didn't like my drawings either. That aperture at the proximal side of the interosseous membrane or ligament is going to be really important because it's going to serve literally like the other apertures that we've seen, right? So another word for aperture that we've explored so far in anatomy is a foramen, right? Foramen just means hole. So this aperture, just like the other foramen, and let me ask you this, obturator foramen. Why do I need an obturator foramen? I need the nerve and the artery to pass through to another section. This aperture is going to serve the same purpose because what we're going to see is that my common fibular nerve Right? Remember that word common means going to split into two. Is then going to split into a superficial fibular nerve and a deep fibular nerve. Well, what we have to think about is how the deep fibular nerve is then going to pass through to the anterior compartment. And we'll get into that in a second to innervate all of my anterior compartment muscles. It's also a key piece of information because one diagnosis that you may see and you may actually have to do a little bit of detective work on is something called anterior compartment syndrome who's heard of anterior compartment syndrome yeah anterior compartment syndrome can be a medical emergency so if you're and we're going to go over the pattern recognition process for anterior compartment syndrome but you have to understand how the anatomy works in order to make sure that you're diagnosing it correctly. All right, any questions on osteology here? Yes. More horizontal, more often than not. How about that for an answer? I, I hate to I hate to use that. It depends. There's gonna be some variation. There is a tiny, tiny little aperture, but to be honest with you, it's not always there. So the one of the proximal is always there. It does. It does. Yeah. So deep fibular nerve, anterior tibial artery will pass through those. I saw one more hand up. She answered. Okay. All right, one more point on this slide and then we'll move on to the next slide. So at my distal end, and this is going to get a little bit into foot and ankle stuff. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of carryover between sections here. My fibula is going to terminate in something called my lateral malleolus. Now, what I will say, and I'll ask you guys to press pause for a second. Do you guys know what the primacy effect is? 
Okay, primacy effect is an educational psychological term that when you hear something the first time, it tends to stick with you. The reason I say this is that eventually I'm going to make a mistake on pronouncing malleolus. If you notice, I pause right before I say malleolus. And the reason that I pause right before I say malleolus is that when I took anatomy, that was pronounced malleolus. Uh, whoa. Exactly. So way up in Ohio, right, where I'm from, it is pronounced malleolus. I did not know that was not the correct pronunciation until I moved outside the state of Ohio. And I moved to South Florida, and I was talking to a PA. I'm like, yeah, I think they've injured their ladder malleolus. And she looked at me and she goes, what in the – what is that? I was like – like we had this whole big brouhaha discussion over it. And then uh, she goes, you mean malleolus? And I was like, malleolus? And like, she's like, no, malleolus. So – I say that because of the primacy effect. So if I slip off and say malleolus, you know what I'm talking about. But I will do my very best to pause and say malleolus. Fair? Okay. You guys will see little things like that. You'll see little differences. Healthcare is a very regional thing. It is a very regional thing. All right. So if I have a lateral malleolus, that means I'm also going to have a medial malleolus. My tibia is going to terminate into my medial malleolus. Now, a couple things to note here. One is that my lateral malleolus is going to project further inferiorly than my medial malleolus. That is going to become a huge concept because what you guys are going to see, and you guys already saw this in tests and measures, my patients typically have much more inversion range than they do eversion range, right? Also, what you have to start thinking about is potential injuries. You have to start thinking about how this person landed, how they fell, how they got hurt, right? What sort of tiger ripped off their leg? You know, all these great potential exam questions, right? Someone getting shanked with a toothbrush or something, right? So if you think about it, if I am weight bearing and I jump up, then I'm not weight bearing and I land. And I go into extreme eversion. Is there a possibility that my foot would crash into the lateral malleolus before the medial malleolus? Yeah. So what do we call that? It's an impact injury or a crush injury, right? I got a bone ramming into another bone. It's a bad day in the office. So. Think about things like this, okay? Because we're going to see patients. Remember, like I said, the fibula, relatively non-weight bearing. It bears a little bit of weight in some people. I've had plenty of patients. They walk into my office. They do not wear a cast, no crutch, no nothing. And they have a fibular fracture. In fact, I had a case. This would have been about 15 years ago. Football player walked in. He had a fibular fracture, and I was the one to say, I think there's something really wrong with your leg because nobody looked at it. And yes. I'm sorry? Well, because people use them to see and they um they use position This this was a an odd case where what I found out later was they never actually saw the position. Yeah, so it was a, it was a strange, odd case, but we got him where he needed to go, and that's the moral of the story. Um, but what I will say is it was a very interesting conversation. So ankle fracture 
is going to be a lot of different terms, right? So what we're going to talk about is there are several different types of ankle fractures, right? So I can have a unimalleolar fracture, I can have a bimalleolar fracture, and then I can have this bonus fracture called a trimalleolar fracture. Has anyone seen a patient with a trimalleolar fracture? Has anyone ever wondered why in the world it's called trimalleolar? Because we only have two malleoluses, malleoli. I say I tried not to say malleoli. It's just it just rolls off the tongue, right? So so a trimalleolar fracture is lateral malleolus, medial malleolus, distal tibia, posterior distal tibia. So it's why they call it trimalleolar. I don't know, right? All I know is when I was coming out of school, I'm like that doesn't make any sense. So I'm trying to help you guys out a little bit. Any questions about osteology here? Cool. All right, a little bit of cross-section. Now, like I said, cross-sectional anatomy, super, super important. The reason it's super important is, number one, if you are planning to stick needles into patients, I would highly recommend knowing your cross-sectional anatomy, especially if you stick a needle in me. In fact, if you stick a needle in me, I'm going to make sure you know your cross-sectional anatomy before that needle gets inserted. Because what we're going to see is that depending on where I am in each of these compartments, I'm going to have all sorts of fun structures to work around, like nerves and arteries and veins and all sorts of great stuff. Now, first thing, when we look at cross-sectional anatomy is orientation, right? And we kind of discussed this a little bit last semester, but we're going to discuss it again. All right, so I don't know why, but lower leg cross-sectional anatomy to me looks like a little, like an avocado. I didn't look like an avocado? It's a tic oh, okay. It, it's, <laughs> all you had to say was this is a TikTok and I just stopped listening. <laughs> yeah, it was, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Don't don't even get me started on the TikTok. <clears throat> the TikTok. All right. So first thing cross sectionally we have to worry about here, and what I will recommend is, like I said, orientation. Now, if we remember cross sectional anatomy of the thigh, how many bones am I looking for? One. Cross sectional anatomy of the lower leg, how many bones am I looking for? Two. Right. So on an exam. Next year, in imaging, when you get a CT scan, which are all primarily done cross-sectionally, or you get a cross-sectional MRI, and I put an arrow on the lower leg, and someone says, that's your quad, I'm not going to give you credit. Okay? That's just that's where we're going to stand. So two big bones I'm going to worry about here. Number one big bone I'm going to worry about is going to be my tibia. So if my tibia is there, we're going to call this medial side, and then we'll call the other side the lateral side. The other bone that we're going to have here is going to be my fibula. Now, what we're going to see is that my tibia and my fibula are going to serve as huge anchor points for a lot of these structures. A lot of these structures are going to come off of the tibia or the fibula or both. So before we draw in the compartments, what we're going to draw in is we're going to draw the dividing sections. Okay, now remember that my word for a dividing section is going to be septum, right? And we kind of already talked about that a little bit in the upper arm last semester, a little bit in the thigh, right? So septum is just going to mean divider. So when someone has a deviated septum, which is a common diagnosis, the divider between the right and left nostril is, is deviated. That's all that means. 
So the first big septum that I'm going to see here is one that we actually have already covered. Okay, and what we're going to see is this is going to be my interosseous membrane. My interosseous membrane, like I said earlier, is going to keep my anterior stuff anterior, is going to keep my posterior stuff posterior. Coming off of my fibula, I'm going to have two different septa, which is just a plural for septum. I'm going to have the anterior intermuscular septum. And I'm also going to have a posterior intermuscular septum. Now, both of these structures literally say what they are, and they are what they say. What does intermuscular mean? Between muscles. What does septum mean? Dividing structure. So all my anterior intramuscular septum is, is the dividing structure between the muscles in the front. That's it. My posterior intramuscular septum is the dividing structure in between the muscles in the back. That's it. The space on the lateral portion between my anterior and my posterior intramuscular septa, and this little section in here, This little section is going to be called my lateral compartment. Now, in my lateral compartments, I'm going to see a lot of really, really commonly named structures with common actions, common innervations, all sorts of commonalities. So much so that if I know what section I'm in, if I know what compartment I'm in, and trust me when I say this, guys, we've done this on lab exams in the past. I did this two years ago. I did a transtibial amputation. We tied it together, and we stuck a muscle with a pin right down from the top. And so you should, you had to know what section you're in. You had to know where you were in that orientation. So my lateral compartment is where my fibularis muscles, two out of the three, okay? Fibularis tertius is gonna sit in the anterior compartment. But fibularis longus and brevis are gonna sit in this lateral compartment. These primarily are going to be my everters. And are going to be innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. So at this stage, I want to press the pause button again, and I want to go over another anatomic science point here. You've probably noticed I've called it fibularis longus, fibularis brevis, superficial fibular nerve. I did not use the word peroneal, and here's why. There is a big push in anatomic sciences right now to get rid of the Greek and go strictly with Latin to make the language consistent. Peroneal is Greek. 
And we see that in some other structures, like scaphoid, for example. Scaphoid is Greek. But what I would like to do is get rid of this term peroneal for this course because I personally think when we call it fibularis, it makes a lot more sense, right? Because those are the muscles that ride up and down my fibula. It makes no sense to have this fibular bone, which in Greek is actually called the peroneus bone. It makes no sense to call it the fibula and then have these muscles coming off of it called the peroneus. So my lateral compartment, fibularis longus, fibularis brevis, those are going to evert my ankle. And those are going to be innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. Now, as we can see, we've already created another compartment here. And this is the anterior compartment. So my anterior compartment is this whole section up here. All the way down to the interosseous membrane. So this is my anterior compartment. What we're going to see is that my anterior compartment are primarily going to be my dorsiflexors. And they're going to be innervated by the deep fibular nerve. Okay, so those are two of the four sections so far. How are we doing? Having fun? The other big septa that we're going to see here is going to basically go from my fibula all the way out to this medial aspect of the tibia. And this is going to be called the transverse intermuscular septa or septum. And as you can see, what that transverse intramuscular septum has done is it's created two separate chambers in the posterior aspect of the leg. So what we're going to have is we're going to have a superficial posterior compartment, and we're also going to have a deep posterior compartment. So the section here in light green is going to be this deep posterior compartment. Okay, so my deep posterior compartment these are going to house my deep plantar flexors. My deep plantar flexors are going to be tibialis posterior, flexor hallucis longus, and flexor digitorum longus. Those are commonly known in anatomy as the Tom, Dick, and Harry muscles. The reason they're called the Tom, Dick, and Harry muscles is that is their orientation as they pass through the tarsal tunnel. What I will ask is this. As you guys are dissecting those, make sure you get deep enough that you can see the proximal attachments 
for those three deep planar flexors because what you will see is that they don't follow that orientation approximately. And in fact, what happens is tibialis posterior, flexor hallucis longus, and flexor digitorum longus twist, and they change their orientation. Because what we see, and we're gonna get into this a little later, is that flexor hallucis longus primarily originates off the fibula and a little bit of the interosseous membrane. Flexor digitorum longus originates primarily off the tibia and a little bit of the interosseous membrane. And tibialis posterior spans both fibula and tibia and a ton of the interosseous membrane. So make sure that you know not only that distal orientation, that Tom, Dick, and Harry orientation, but also how those muscles are formed and their relative position to one another in the proximal section as well. Because again, what's gonna happen on lab exam, Dr. Jessica's not gonna go in, we're gonna split the gastroc, we're gonna split the soleus, and we're gonna tag one of those muscles proximal. I can just about guarantee it. So make sure you know the orientation proximally and distally. Yep. It's, it's the all three. Oh. The all three twist orientation. The last section here is going to be the superficial posterior compartment. So that's my superficial posterior compartment. My superficial posterior compartment is going to house my superficial plantar flexors. My superficial plantar flexors are going to be the ones that we are most commonly familiar with, which are going to be gastrocnemius and soleus. Now, you guys may encounter this in the reading. When gastrocnemius and soleus are mentioned as a group, So gastroc and soleus, a lot of times this is called triceps surae. Surae just refers to the sural nerve or what's commonly known as the lower leg. That's all surae means. Triceps obviously means three heads. Because gastroc and soleus come together with three different origins, right? And we kind of saw that already with triceps brachii, right? Three different origins, one common insertion. The other muscle that we're going to see in the superficial posterior compartment is going to be this tiny, tiny little, I'm not even sure why we have it, but it's there muscle called plantaris. The plantaris muscle belly, if you guys have seen in cadaver lab, is like the size of, I don't know, one of those dates you buy from Aldi's. With a tendon, that's about 10 times the length of the muscle belly. So it is another muscle that we're going to encounter in there. Okay, honestly, plantaris should be a pretty easy tag on an exam. Okay, because it's the only muscle that looks like it. There's no other muscle that looks like it. Really, there really isn't. 
Okay, any questions on cross-sexual anatomy here? Make sure you know cross-sexual anatomy. Like I said, if you know the sections, you're going to be able to make a lot of inferences based on what that muscle does. Yes, sir. Uh, how so how the tendons pass through the tarsal tunnel is why they're called Tom, Dick and Harry, because what what we'll see is Tom passes through first, which is tibialis posterior. Then Dick passes through next to it, which is flexor digitorum longus. And then it's called Tom, Dick, A, N, Harry, Tom, Dick, and Harry, because then the artery and the nerve both pass through and then Harry passes through, which is flexor hallus as long as. It's actually going to be posterior to anterior. Which, like I said, remember, all these muscles that we're studying right now are all going to do this huge 90 degree bend because they have to all get through the bottom of the foot. Because what we're going to see is that a lot of these muscles are going to be named based on what they do or where they are, right? So, Tibialis anterior, like I said, multiple actions. Tibialis posterior is going to have multiple actions. What we're also going to see is that fibularis longus and anterior tib or tibialis anterior are going to be two of my key muscles that are actually going to cross under the plantar surface of the foot to provide a sling. And they're actually going to provide a ton of arch support. All right, how are we doing? Yes. What do you think? Yes. Tibial nerve. Yep. So tibial nerve is going to innervate my deep posterior compartment, and tibial nerve is going to innervate my superficial posterior compartment. Okay. At differing root levels, right? Because we're going to see that same concept that the higher the origin, the higher the root level. So my suggestion as well, understand those root levels, okay? Because what we're gonna do probably for the last couple of classes is start integrating a lot of this information because what you will have to do as a physical therapist is identify that patient that walks in with a foot drop. So what's a foot drop? Right, so so a foot drop or a foot slap looks like what? Right? So I'm not able to essentially control dorsiflexion. Right? My dorsiflexions are not strong enough. Now, a lot of different reasons that can happen. So let's think about this. If I cut my anterior compartment with the weed whacker, which I've actually seen in the clinic, would I potentially show foot drop? Yeah. If I have a, let's call it L5 S1 disc bulge, could I potentially see foot drop? Yeah. And in fact, I saw this probably about let's call it five years ago in the clinic, had a patient come in, diagnosis was peroneal strain, okay? Lady gets up out of the waiting room, and me personally, I always do a little bit of gait analysis as we walk from the waiting room back to the exam room. I saw a significant foot drop. Now, what she did was she compensated for her foot drop. Okay, so remember what I said, we're going to compensate by moving another joint more than what we should or moving another plane more than what we should. So what do you guys think would be a common compensation for foot drop? Hip hypothesis might be one. What else? Circumduction might be another one. What else? What's that? Big hip flexion. Yeah, that's what this lady was doing. Okay, why would someone overly flex their hip and overly flex their knee. Clear the foot, clear the toes, exactly. So that's what the person was doing. Normal step on the left. I mean, it looked like she was stepped over her back every single time. 
So that was a situation where, and I had to do a lot of testing, called up the doc and said, hey, um, I think this person needs an MRI in the low back. And the doctor you know, asked why and everything. And he said, okay, you know, let's go ahead and do it. Calls me up a couple days later. Thank you so much. I sent her in for surgery. So if I would have gone with what the referral said, we would have done all sorts of ankle TheraBand and all sorts of fun stuff, right? What's up? Exactly. She would have got worse and worse and worse. And I would have said, why? I don't understand. We're doing all these great exercises, right? She's standing on foam. We're throwing the ball up and down. Maybe we're doing that little balloon toss thing, right? You know, all that stuff. And that's because it wasn't coming from her foot. It was coming from her low back. So, so that's why every single person you see, make sure you are thorough with your examination. When we as professors tell you this stuff, it is the truth. I don't tell you a fake story in this class. I tell you all true stories, right? Everything has actually happened. All right, let's go ahead and let's cut it here, and then I will see everybody on Monday, or I'll see you in lab. Deep fibular nerve and anterior tibial artery. We're getting to those later.